makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francie Lacqua here in London with the conversations that matter, and here's what's coming up on today's program. U.S. stocks seek a magnificent boost from big tech earnings as investors look for an AI-powered rebound on Wall Street. Now, the U.S. House passes aid packages for Ukraine. The Israel and Taiwan, Volodymyr Zelensky, says billions of dollars in new funding could help Kyiv retake the initiative against Russian forces. Plus, Tesla spends the weekend cutting prices as sales slump, and its shares slide. The focus turns to the EV maker's crucial earnings report tomorrow. Also ahead, a look at luxury. We'll have an exclusive conversation with the Mayhula chief executive and Valentino chairman Rashid Mohammed Rashid. That's at 9.30 a.m. UK time. Now, first thing is first, let's take a look at the European markets. Net map, we had a pretty volatile and in certain cases pretty difficult week last week. Today, we're seeing a little bit of a rebound. You can see the FTSE gaining 1%, the DAX gaining two-tenths of 8%. Again, the focus really has shifted from the Middle East. Uh, tensions to company earnings and economic in da data for any insight into the direction of central bank policy. So a couple of things we need to watch out for. Treasuries, there's a number of auctions, of course, uh, th that will come into play. So you can see the U.S. 10-year yield for the moment, 46414. Euro dollar, 106.58. And, of course, all of this plays into the uh, divergence between what the Fed does, what the ECB does, and where that leaves the Bank of England. Now let's bring in Allianz, Chief Economist Ludovic Soubran in Paris. Uh, joining us here in the studios, Bloomberg's Justina Lee. So thank you both for joining us. Ludovic, let's start with you. When you look at the big week ahead, a lot of the focus, of course, will be on central banks. Is there anything that you think could now deter the ECB from cutting rates come June 6? Um, not much, I hope. I, I'm still in the camp of people that think that the ECB won't cut uh, without knowing almost for sure that the Fed will cut this year. So I think one of the issues is really the ECB being in this uh, Schrodinger's cat situation. They cannot really start a loosening cycle without the assurance that the Fed will start later this year, even if it's after the summer and they stop before the summer. So for me, that's the one piece of the puzzle that is a bit complicated, but I guess the IMF spring meetings were a time where maybe some central banker chit chat happened to make sure that this is telegraphed and this is going not too much in an unsynchronized way. And Ludovic, I know you have a really important, uh, you talk about Italian law driving markets, and this is basically the interplay between geopolitics, especially after the nervousness that we saw last week, and what this means for risk taking in markets. Yeah, I'm, I'm very uh, surprised by how markets take uh, the current uh, situation between Israel and Iran and the Middle East in general. They seem to be completely. Uh, and unfazed, if you will, by, by the situation. So I call that Italian law. It's, you know, an eye for an eye, and then everything's go back to normal. I find that very optimistic. I think markets, of, of, by definition, equity markets are front-loading good news this past few months. But I find the situation, especially what you see in the geopolitical risk premium in the oil prices, I find the situation to be taken a bit lightly, even the level of escalation that could ensue and, and what it could mean for the region and more generally for the world, right? So I, I find that to be, um, to be yeah, I, I call that Italian law because I, it's as if markets believe in Italian law uh, when it comes to the Middle East. Uh, what's your take, Justina, on the kind of markets that we could see this week? So, again, there's going to be a big driver from the big seven. I know Tesla's maybe a little bit to one side because they disappointed in sales and the stock is down 40 percent this year. But so we'll get a lot of driving impetus for the S&P from these tech earnings. But then it's all about central bank divergence. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this week we're going to get data from kind of uh, the Fed's preferred inflation measure at the end of this week, and we're also going to get U.S. output data. And I think kind of this divergence is kind of pretty interesting in that it does seem like there are a lot of factors that seem kind of almost unique to the U.S. at the moment that might even tell you something about kind of the structural dynamics in the U.S. economy. And I think, you know, the question here is, especially with earnings coming up, is that we've kind of had this really strong kind of run up in U.S. stocks anyway. So could it be that even if we do get those earnings numbers that markets might be looking for, that in a way it's already been priced in? Um, what do you think, Ludovic? I mean, again, when you look at the, the economy, is there a difference between what you think the economy will do and actually some of the market movements that Justine is talking about? Well, I, I, I do think that the markets are really ahead of themselves, you know, and the earnings season is going to confirm that, especially the U.S. earnings seasons. Um, I, I find that quite interesting as a disconnect. But, of course, you know, you're, if you're listed, it means you're a good company. 
But I think the SME, the small and medium enterprises, are not doing that good. And you, you see bankruptcy levels really rising all across the U.S. and Europe. So it's not only a European story. So I find this economy, this uh, this you know biggest beautiful type of gradient, to be quite interesting. And of course, this will be confirmed again. So I think the economy is really lagging compared to what we see in the markets. Yeah. So when you look at Ludovic, I mean, one of the, the other things that we're really trying to figure out is actually the Bank of England, which is probably the most interesting central bank right now, just because of market bets. So if, if there's an assumption that the Fed, of course, waits and delays, and if there's an assumption that the ECB cuts June the 6th, the, the, you know, half the bets for the BOE are they follow the Fed, the other half of like, no, they'll follow the ECB, only one can be right. Uh, look, we... Uh we have uh, the BOE following the ECB actually as of now. So we, we didn't uh, postpone our BOE rate cuts after we see that the Fed cut will be moved. But, you know, for the BOE, just like for the uh, Fed, it's a very politicized move also because the UK is general election is around the corner. So you want to have the beginning of a loosening cycle so that it doesn't, you know, synchronize too much with your election. That's the same for the Fed. That's why we have a cut in September instead of November that the data would suggest. So, so right now the, the, the Bank of England is, uh, is cutting in the summer for us, yeah. Uh, Justina, what's your take on Treasuries? Again, there's going to be a lot of auctions and a lot of market participants are on tenterhooks to see if they go okay. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this week we're going to get a massive amount of treasuries being auctioned and especially for kind of like the shorter end of the tenors you know two year five year that's going to be a record amount and i think a lot of people are trying to see you know we have seen kind of yields coming up are people kind of happy with this level of yields how how strong are demand and of course kind of with markets kind of newly pricing in the prospect of like a much later rate cut i think people are kind of trying to see how those few things kind of intersect um, what's your take on China, Ludovic? I mean, we're going around the world in like, you know, very fast because there's just so much to talk about. China still seems the, the big unknown. I, I think the numbers last week were quite good. I, th I think people tend to uh, underestimate the fact that China is ready to do whatever it takes to get back in the saddle. And, and I think they're ready to do a lot. Uh, they're, they're extremely concerned about, uh, you know, the trade muted uh, situation. And they're concerned, of course, about how depressed the consumer is after, you know, the real estate, you know, ramification. So I think I'm, I'm quite optimistic on China right now. At least I'm, I'm in line with markets, which have been also quite optimistic lately on China. But, but of course, it's a, it's a very uh, fragile uh, equilibrium. And, um, and it will depend on how much fiscal they're ready to do additional to what is already in the pipe, which means, you know, an additional. For us, it's uh, we have another rate, uh, RRR, reserve requirement ratio cut, and we have another point of fiscal stimulus. And we have the remedy that depreciates slightly. That should help, I would say, China get to 4.5% annualized growth by the second quarter. So, do you see actually China importing deflation, or does that stabilize? You know, I... <laughs> That's that's a big uh, big topic. I think China right now, uh, the deflation story is really ingraining the real estate uh, crisis or the depressed consumer demand. I think they're really trying to fight it, but they trying to do it without recreating a bubble, and so it takes more time. So for us, you know, we see the inflation story in China stabilizing only in the second half of the year. So this first half is actually quite negative for China still because you know the consumer is depressed. I mean, it's, it's really the investment function is down. Um, and even if there is a, a form of an external driver to the growth, especially the U.S. economy, I mean, they've been, you know, the, the exports from China to the U.S. have been explosive, exploding. So talk about decoupling here. Um, in the end, you know, the domestic story is very uh, muted. Factories are really working on a lower regime. And it's because there is no, um, you know, there, there is very little demand in the pipeline. So you can see that in the inflation number. So it stabilizes only in the second half when the eurozone mm. is actually getting real income effects and then China can re-export a lot more to the eurozone. I mean, that's so interesting. We'll talk about it for another three hours. But, uh, Justina, you know, when you look at some of the tech stocks, I mean, are, are we expecting too much from the Magnificent Seven this week? Yeah, I think one statistic I just read that I thought was really striking is that, I mean, the earnings expectations for the Magnificent Seven are around kind of 38% year on year. And that's what people are expecting for the first quarter. But if you look at the S&P 500, excluding these seven stocks, it's actually down 4%. 
And I think that just goes on to tell you that, you know, when we talk about the S&P 500 these days, a lot of the time we're talking about the Magnificent Seven. And so a lot of this rally year today really has been driven by the extraordinary story in these seven stocks. And so it's not just about, I mean, we talk about U.S. economic resilience, but it's also about kind of these structural trends in AI and so on. And that really is kind of, I mean, to kind of our guest point, I mean, it's just showing you the divergence between small caps and these seven stocks. Justina, thank you so much. As always, Justina Lee there from Bloomberg. And we'll be back with the Alliance Chief Economist, Ludovic Subran. We'll have plenty more, of course, markets and treasuries. This is Bloomberg. Everyone, let's return to Allianz Chief Economist Ludovic Soubran in Paris. Ludo, as always, really great to have you on the program. We talk a little bit about China. We talk about the, the divergence between the ECB and the Fed. I mean, how much of your time are you spending on India, which is, I guess, the next frontier for possible investments? Uh, look, India is a big country for us at Allianz. We are one of the largest insurers. We work with Bajaj, which is a, a, a large Indian uh, uh, you know, conglomerate, you know, company. So we're very happy. Uh, I would say we, we wrote a report about India. My main cons the main positive stuff, and you've seen the elections, you know, is the continuity on the policy reform momentum. It's crazy. It's, it's fascinating for middle power to be so much on track with unleashing the economic uh, engines. You know, India used to be very protectionistic. Uh, very protectionist. They used to have, you know, very um, obscure and opaque, you know, insolvency law. Um, you know, the demonetization shock was a big uh, um, topic, a big drag on growth and so forth. And now they're really changing. And so far, it's very positive. I think on the longer term, my concern is how do you open up the economy even more without creating financial liberalization type of crisis? How do you handle the uh, climate change uh, topic? Because parts of India are really under duress for future climate hazard. And third, how do you uh, tap into the, the savings? You know, how do you make sure the Indian savings are put to good use, especially financing infrastructure, financing social infrastructure, education, health, and so forth. So for us at Allianz, it's really a, a great, great country to be in, to invest, and to work on. And, um, and uh, yeah, we, I, I, I'm quite optimistic on India. 6% growth per annum. Uh, inflation to be more or less under control. Uh, the big question is the transformation to continue with the big agenda of a yeah. 1 billion plus economy. Yeah, and I think if the transformation continues, you expect it also to, to be the third largest globally by 2030. Ludovic, thank you. As always, two short times, so we'll have to get you back on. Allianz Chief Economist Ludovic Subran for us in Paris. Coming up, U.S. aid passes the House. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky says billions of dollars in new funding could help Kyiv retake the initiative against Russian forces. That story is next, and this is Bloomberg. Welcome back, everyone. So the U.S. Senate is expected to pass $95 billion in fresh aid for Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan this week. This is after the end of a six month of political deadlock in the House. Now, senators plan to vote on the package this Tuesday. Now, I'm joined by Bronwyn Maddox, director and chief executive of Chatham House. Bronwyn, as always, thank you so much for joining us. If the aid comes through, how much of a material difference does this do to Ukraine? A lot. Some of the damage in reputation and confidence has been done already. The U.S. has cast doubt on whether it is a reliable ally who is going to keep on supporting uh, Ukraine for this. But uh, the actual aid coming through, the demonstration that there were a lot of votes in, in Congress as well, and the, the packages of, of uh, military support that the pan Pentagon is said to have ready already, that is going to make a big, big difference because this was a year when Ukraine could easily have um, lost this war. And it does, as President Zelensky say, uh, says, give it, Ukraine a, a really good chance of holding on to its position in this fight, of not being driven out. Does it depend a lot on how quickly the, you know, some of the aid and some of the money can actually get to the front line? Is, is time now critical? Time is critical, but the promise of the aid, the assurance that it is coming, is worth a lot because it means that Ukraine doesn't have to conserve 
its munitions as much as it has been doing. It's really been very, very short um, of all kinds of, uh, of missiles and ammunition. There was a lot of concern last week, of course, that Iran would retaliate after the strikes from Israel. Do you think we're in a safer zone right now? I think we are. And if there is any um, bit of confidence we can look to in this extremely dangerous situation, it is that Iran does not seem to want a wider war. It said all kinds of belligerent things about being prepared for that wider war, if, if forced on it, so to speak. But it has... Um, done what it can to say face and then signaled repeatedly that it doesn't want an escalation. Don't get me wrong, it's causing all kinds of trouble uh, in the region and deliberately so. And we're hearing reports that it's moving into Sudan, so threatening access to, to the, the Red Sea. So all kinds of trouble, but it does not seem to want that wider war. And I hope we can now look at some kind of de-escalation of this. What's China's role in this, if any? I know there are a number of U.S. officials, of course, traveling to China this week. Can they play? They played a big role with Russia and Ukraine. Are they also playing a role in the Middle East? They're cautiously looking at the um, the support and the working uh, relationships they have in the region. One of which is with uh, Iran, but they're also close to countries in the Gulf. They, as ever, I think, would like to be on the winning side. Uh, they don't want an active conflict that gets out of hand, but very much would like those they have uh, associations with to come out on the right side. That's been very much their stance over Russia and Ukraine as well. How are you expecting the Middle East to develop from, from now? We know that there were calls, of course, from the U.S. to the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, to temper his response. Is anyone in the Israeli government, government listening? I'm sure they're listening. Whether they intend to change what they're doing by a, um, a millimetre, I'm not sure. Um, but the U.S., while being increasingly strong on, in words and in saying, for example, it won't support a particular IDF, uh, Israel Defense Force unit that's been operating in the West Bank, that's been accused of a lot of aggression against Palestinians, some things like that. It hasn't taken the big, big steps like cutting off support <laughs> for Israel. Indeed, it's, it's uh, as we've just been discussing, has affirmed more of that through Congress. Um, so... I, I think, that, you know, this is a complex picture. The U.S. is the only country, really, that can talk to uh, Israel in that way. But lots of other countries are usefully playing a part, particularly to me, Saudi Arabia. And China, of course, brokered this deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran uh, in, in the past couple of years. And that has had more solidity than I expected at the time. And I think Saudi Arabia is really key to this, wanting stability in the region, wanting, if it can, normalization of relations uh, with, with Israel, uh, wanting all kinds of, of deals with the US, um, but wanting in return for that uh, assurances for the Palestinians of a kind that Israel may, and this Israeli government may be in no mood to make. The, the attacks on October 7th happened just before actually normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Will that be back on the cards at some point? Possibly in the sense that one party to that normalization, Saudi Arabia, appears interested if it can get the terms it wants. But those terms are now very different from before October the 7th and before what has happened in Gaza. And they include a lot of assurances about something approaching a state for the Palestinians. So we are you know, in all kinds of countries, uh, in, including the UK, including much of the Gulf, are talking about a two-state solution perhaps being uh, revived as part of this awful um, set of events over the past six months. But the trouble is that two of the parties that seem least interested in a two-state solution are this Israeli government and big blocks of the Palestinians themselves. Um, Bronwyn, I've been told that actually the, lot, the next six months are extremely difficult and could be extremely crucial because you'll have a lot of countries around the world trying to test uh, the U.S. ahead of the election. Do you agree with that theory? Yes. This year, uh, the American presidential 
and congressional elections just hang over this year like nothing I can really remember. I'm recently back from Japan where the phrase, what if Trump uh, was inserted and in, in, sometimes jokingly, sometimes not, into almost every conversation. But for a lot of countries, this really affects their calculations about how to position themselves and what they might expect from the US. You know, the big question is, how is the US going to position itself in the world and what will it do for its allies and those it opposes? But many have come around, particularly in Europe, to taking the point that they do need to do more for their own defence. Bronwyn, thank you so much, as always, for your wonderful insight. Bronwyn Maddox, our director and chief executive of Chatham House. Coming up, we're also joined by Mahula, chief executive and Valentino chairman, Rashid Mohammed Rashid, to discuss his outlook as the European luxury sector faces a significant first quarter slowdown. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. So U.S. stocks see, seek a magnificent boost from big tech earnings as investors look for an AI-powered rebound on Wall Street. The U.S. House passes aid packages for Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan. Volodymyr Zelensky says billions of dollars in new funding could help Kyiv retake the initiative against Russian forces. Plus, Tesla spends the weekend cutting prices as sales slump and its shares slide. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. So global luxury sales could exceed 400 billion euros in 2025, boosted by a fuller recovery of tourism. That's the view of Bloomberg Intelligence. Now, the estimate comes despite the sector in Europe facing a significant slowdown in the first quarter on lower demand from China. Well, that caused Caring shares to tumble last month after warning of a steep drop in sales at its Gucci brand. Now, Caring bought a 30 percent stake in Valentino last year to try and strengthen its portfolio. And in March, Valentino also named the former Gucci creator director Alessandro Michele as its new top designer. So for a look at how the Caring Valentino partnership is progressing and the outlook for the sector, I'm delighted to be joined exclusively by Valentino's chairman, Rashid Mohamed Rashid. He's also, of course, the chief executive officer of Qatar's Mahula, the investment fund that owns Valentino, and amongst others, the French fashion house Balmain. So, Mr. Rashid, thank you so much thank for you. joining us. I mean, Pleasure. it's exciting times. It's difficult times for the luxury sector, but they also started at such a high. How do you see demand developing right now? Well, the last three years have been really exceptional for uh, luxury products. Uh, post the pandemic, there have been uh, a very significant surge. I mean, the average was 7% when usually the luxury market grows around 3 4%. We have seen three consecutive years of 7%. I think uh, since second half last year, we have definitely seen a slowdown, uh, not only in, in Europe, but also in the U.S. And there was always a question mark about how fast China will recover. This year started with an expectation that the luxury markets will grow between 2 to 4%. Mm -hmm. My personal feeling it will be much less than that. Probably it will be flat. The reality is that Europe, US is still very flat at the moment and China is still weak. And we have already seen some companies coming with some uh, results. Uh, and it is very clear that it is quite a challenging environment in 2024. So what makes an exceptional brand? You're relaunching Valentino yes. with the former Gucci creative director, Alessandro Michele. Is he going to focus on certain pieces? What do you think will sell in this dampened environment? Well, Valentino had an amazing uh, performance in the last 10 years. And uh, Pier Paolo has been an amazing designer. And we have done fantastic with the brand. I mean, we acquired the brand and it was less than 250 million. Today is 1.4 billion. And uh, not only the size, but also the reputation, the attractiveness, the, the, the luxury positioning of Valentino have been exceptional. Uh, it, is, it is true that we have a change in designer today uh, because we believe that there will be a new chapter in Valentino. And uh, we believe that Valentino as a brand is so rich in terms of its archive, in, so, in terms of its history, that there is so many dimensions and so many presentations of Valentino. And we are hoping our new designer... Alessandro Michael, who's an exceptional designer, will be capable of presenting something different from a Valentino point of view. We know that in the last few years, there have been uh, quite luxury prevailing. Yep. Uh, my, my guess, like many others in the fashion, this is going to be over. 
So I think people, as usual in, in fashion, they get bored. So there is a cycle, and I think fashion and colors and design and creativity is going to come back with force. And uh, we are getting ready for that, yeah. And, and, and where are you expecting a pickup in luxury, actually, to, to start from? Is it the U.S. consumer that's still all-powerful for companies such as yourself? Well, we have, seen a com we have seen a significant shift in spending. That's explained the slowdown that we have seen in the last uh, nine months from, from goods to experience. So we see travelers are spending more on hospitality, on experience, on restaurants, on different aspects of entertainment. Uh, but again, like everything else, this is cyclical. So uh, we believe that U.S is going to continue to be influential. For us in Valentino, U.S. is a very, very significant market. Uh, Europe have always been the base of Valentino, but really the, the prospect for us, especially with our new uh, design and new approach now, is how to start really much bigger business in China. But China, as we know, I mean, there is a question mark about how fast China is recovering, uh, and uh, the signs are very clear that maybe in the second half of this year we are going to see a recovery there, yeah. How's the partnership with Karen going? Well, it has been a very, very positive partnership. I mean, they have 30% of the company. Uh, we, we have uh, a strategic, really, alliance in that sense. Uh, the company has a very clear plan for what to do in the next few years, so that, that is not going to change. And I think, you know, the attractiveness of the plan of the company, the vision of the company, the brand, have been really the reason why this uh, deal has happened, yeah. Is there, I mean, they're, they're concerned, of course, they're so reliant on Gucci. If Gucci sales are down, do you think you can even foster more that partnership between... Well, I, I, and... I think Kering is an amazing company, and they have done fantastic. If you look at what they have done in the last 10 years, 15 years, it's an exceptional performance. And even a brand like Gucci that people are uh, questioning, you know, how fast it will recover today, let's not forget that this is a brand that uh, was only two, three billion less than 10 years ago. Today, it's, you know, it's almost double digit, yeah. So I, I have great confidence, you know, in the capability and the management of, of caring that they will be able really to put all these brands on, on the right track to continue the, an amazing growth there, yeah. I know, I think last time we spoke, I mean, you have Balmain, there were other companies sure. that you're trying to relaunch that... It's true. Are, are, you, are you looking at anything else to, to buy? Do you think the portfolio will get bigger? Sure. I mean, we, we know that there is a big scarcity in, in luxury, and luxury is about amazing brands who exist for a long time, and you cannot just create a luxury brand all of a sudden or from nothing. So there is a bit of history, there is a bit of legacy, there is a bit of archives in it. Uh, Balma is an amazing brand that we have acquired almost six years ago. It has tripled in size, and Balma is a very much a representation of the French luxury uh, houses. And uh, we, we see that there is a huge potential for Balma to continue to grow. It's very much depending on uh, the American market as well as the European market. We are not really big in Asia at the moment, but this is really an early stage of the development of our brand. Apart from that, you know, I'm, I'm always looking for supporting new brands and smaller brands. And this is something that I, I, I find a lot of joy in supporting, you know, uh, new designers and, and uh, creative ideas coming out, yeah. yeah. How much are you sensitive to pricing? There has been definitely a move up to, to price more for the ultra high sure. net worth individual. Do you think that will continue for your goods, but also in general for the luxury industry? Well, it's a, it's a reality that... Post-pandemic, there have been a very significant increase of price. I mean, we, 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 we lived, we're still living in an inflation situation. I mean, I know that everybody is concerned about how inflation is impacting economy and how sticky it is, and we are seeing some stickiness there. But I would, I would, I would say that uh, the level of inflation and increase of prices have been much higher in luxury and exclusive products. And we can see it even in hospitality, even in restaurants, even anything that is luxury and exclusive almost double in price in the last few years. And I, I think that is something that we have to, to, to iron out in the next few years. I think there is a bit of a challenge for luxury products in terms of price uh, positioning at the moment. Some brands doing better than others, and that explains, you know, the disparity between the performance in different brands. But you are right. I mean, pricing is one of the main issues now in luxury. Yeah.
I mean, there's a lot of talk about what happens if we have Donald Trump in the White House with extra tariffs. I don't know whether there's been any chatter of these tariffs also touching luxury goods, but is, is there anything that actually some of you know the, these high-end luxuries companies can do to try and mitigate that? Well, we always worry when you know we, we, we have a scenario of Donald Trump coming back. We don't know really how the impact is going to be in different places. But the reality, of course, the American economy is doing well, and I assume it will continue to do well. And that is very important, really, for the health of the global economy. I think the same goes to China. We want to see China also recovering and, and doing well. It's very, very important that China, because we should not underestimate that China, from a gross contribution point of view, have been a significant, not just to luxury, but to the global economy. So... China slowing down is not also good news for the global economy. So Europe, of course, remains there, and there is a big question about Europe, how, how they will pull it all together, which, which is something that we hope that they can do it in a positive way. Uh, but you are right. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, the, 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 the level of growth that we will see globally will impact the luxury. But also the reality of luxury today is that the middle class in many economies is, is growing significantly. So we have the China, yeah. the China story in the past. Now we have the India story. We, we, we have to look at what happened. Many Asian countries are continuing to develop in a very significant, positive way. So in addition to the traditional America, Europe, Japan, we are seeing a lot of new co companies and, and markets coming up, even in Africa. Yeah. You, you seem pretty excited about working with Alessandro Michele. What are you most looking forward to? What do you think he'll, he'll bring to the brand? Well, I'm very excited to work with Valentino as a brand. That's starting with, because it's an amazing brand. And I, I believe that Alessandro, you know, following an amazing, you know, performance of Pier Paolo, will be able really to bring a new chapter for Valentino with a completely new uh, uh, dimension. As I said, based on this very rich archive that Mr. Valentino Garavani have created, it's an amazing archive. And if you look at it, you will not believe how much is the diversity there. And I think Alessandro will br probably bring another angle from that uh, archive that we have not seen for some time now in a, in a very, very attractive way. Mr. Rashid, thank you so much for joining us today. That was thank Rashid Mohammed Rashid, the chairman of Valentino and Balma and chief executive of Mahula. Coming up, a bill forcing TikTok's Chinese owner to divest its ownership is on a fast track to becoming law in the U.S. We have all of the details next, and this is Bloomberg. <laughs> A bill forcing TikTok's Chinese owner ByteDance to divest its ownership is on fast track to becoming law in the United States. Now, the legislation was included in the aid package passed by the House over the weekend. I'm now joined by Bloomberg's Alex Webb. So, Alex, hi. Where do we go from here? Well, we have, actually, if this does get passed next week, the president has said he will sign it into law very quickly. They then, in theory, have a year to either sell the business, or divest the business, or it will be banned. Now, they have, TikTok has said, it plans to use all legal resource to try and prevent this from happening. There are some legal experts who out there who say that on basis of free speech laws, they actually have quite a good chance uh, of defending themselves against it. It's interesting to see that what's happening on the other side. In China, just last week, we heard that China has stopped Apple from being able to, um, from, from listing WhatsApp and Signal, other messaging apps in China. Of course, Facebook is not available in China, nor are plenty of other Western social media platforms. Chinese state officials have also been talking about the, uh, the infringement of free speech. So there is a certain amount of irony in there. So they have a year from now, but there is going to be a big legal fight coming up. Alex, thank you so much. Alex Webb there of the very latest on ByteDance. Now, with Beijing already becoming a top target in the U.S. election campaign, President Xi's government is also resisting any move that could backfire on the world's second largest economy. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Rebecca Chun Wilkins from Hong Kong. Rebecca, thank you for joining us. So Beijing's response to the latest U.S. measures have been more restrained. How much of a tightrope are they walking here? 
Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. There is a careful balance here that President Xi Jinping is trying to strike. On the one hand, of course, is obliged to respond to this sort of increasing momentum, introducing curbs, not just from the US, but also more of these investigations and probes into subsidies coming from the EU too. So that's a challenge that they must respond to. But on the other hand, they are relying very much on the US audience to be buying up some of its goods. Uh, China is increasingly relied on exports to try and make up some of that shortfall from the property crisis and it's a big part of the story when it comes to China returning to growth so we have seen these much more moderate responses perhaps than we may have seen in the past and, and really it's in line from right back in November in APEC when Biden made that dictator comment Beijing was relatively muted so if we look at the response to the steel tariffs that the Biden administration is proposing this the, the sort of tit for tat measure here China is offering on propionic acid really just targets a very small corner of the market and like, equally when we saw Premier Li Tiang we saw President Xi Jinping engaging quite robustly and concretely pushing back but not with this sort of fire rhetoric but quite reasonable pushback against some of the criticisms of over capacity of unfair treatment of foreign firms so quite pronounced deep and continued engagement from Beijing side Rebecca, thank you so much. As always, Bloomberg's Rebecca Chung Wilkins. Now, coming up, the pressures are mounting for Elon Musk at Tesla as he triggers a new round in the bruising price war for EVs in China. We'll have plenty more on that story next, and this is Bloomberg. Back everyone. Now, Elon Musk has postponed a trip to India, blaming pressing issues at Tesla, which spent the weekend cutting prices for its cars and driver assistance software. Now, this ahead of earnings due out tomorrow that are expected to confirm a first revenue decline in four years. Well, joining us now is Craig Trudell, a global autos editor. Craig, also the one piece that everyone must read, one of many, but the one piece is actually our big take on Tesla. It's a stellar piece. It's a great read. It's not too long. I'll push it out on social media. What did we learn in, in actually trying to piece this together? I think it, it basically reinforces what everybody's worst fears have been, which is that, yes, for the time being, the $25,000 car that everybody was counting on sort of reinvigorating growth for this company has been set aside for this really sort of long odds uh, effort on Musk's part to, to go for robo-taxis. The, the concern that everybody has is, this guy has been going for robo taxis for you know going on eight years now, and this is really really difficult to pull off. But uh, just ask Google, ask General Motors, and uh, you know it's it's not a knock against Tesla in the sense that they have uh, really impressive driver assistance technology, but robo taxi is a, another leap altogether. But uh, Craig, so if he gets robo taxis right, is he a clear winner, full stop? And can he get back on track, or it's just too risky? I think it's a really difficult question to, to answer in the sense that nobody has done it, right? We don't, we don't know how this is going to, to work if and when it does work. Yeah. And everybody's, you know, sort of drawn up these models about how profitable robo-taxis could be theoretically, but we just haven't seen it. And so there's a question of, you know, what's the sort of goal at the end of the rainbow, but also... Can you get there in the first place? And I think the share price is down some 40% since the start of the year. It's, it's part of the Magnificent Seven, and there's questions on whether it should be because it, it's not performing as well as the others. Is there anything that he can at least do to, to stop the share price falling? I think, you know, he, he may be able to sort of uh, spin this as, you know, the $25,000 car is, is deprioritized, but it's not dead, and maybe that will reassure people. But I, I also think that he's, you know, by all, all accounts and all sort of signals he's sent, you know, in the wake of reports about this, is that, you know, he really is convinced that this is the way to go, despite the fact that per, the, per today's big take, even internally he's getting pushback from that. And so, you know, I don't necessarily see a clear path to him, you know, coming on the call tomorrow and saying, you know what, I've Just changed kidding. my mind, I'm going to do the $25,000 car after all. That, that to me feels like it's the sort of thing that the market needs to hear, and I think the likelihood of that is pretty low. Is there anyone he listens to? 
that we know. I mean, but this is a fair question, right? I think it is, yeah. I mean, I, and I do sort of wonder whether or not uh, internally, you know, anybody can get through to him. We, we were able to see from the Walter Isaacson book that they were in this predicament two years ago. And he absolutely uh, is someone who's very sort of, you know, hard-headed, strong in his beliefs, says that he likes uh, negative feedback, and yet we don't necessarily, necessarily see that come through. So interesting. Craig, thanks so much. Craig Trudell, there are Global's autos editors, and I would urge everyone to go and read our big take today. Now, Europe's biggest banks were also picking up uh, the baton this week after mixed results from Wall Street peers. Now, Bloomberg Intelligence warns that with the sector trading near a six-year high, the outlook for lenders may be ripe for a reset if earnings disappoint. Well, for more on the earnings, Bloomberg's Chloe Milley joins us now. So, Chloe, thank you so much for joining us. What are some of the main themes that we're looking out for this week? Well, as with the last couple of quarters and probably for the next few, the, the main theme really is going to be a slowdown in net interest income. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably going to affect most, if not all, of the lenders reporting this week. And that is despite the fact that um, expectations for interest rate cuts have been pared back a little bit. They should, they should still be sluggish net interest income trends. That's kind of across the board. And then if we look at specific banks reporting this week, we've also got um, Deutsche Bank, BNP and Barclays. And for them, uh, another focus will be the performance of the investment bank. Um, this is an area of banking that in general has seen some cuts, some reorganization. So any indication that the levels, the activity is picking up a little bit would be welcome. So what are the main challenges that some of these banks are facing? Well, related to this idea of net interest income slowing down is the idea of cost control. Mm -hmm. um, so the metric called operating jewels, the difference between um, revenue growth and, and cost growth, that is likely to turn negative for, for quite a lot of banks um, this year. So that will be really a key metric going forward. Um, we also have uh, low and loss provisions, so that is not major for first quarter, but going, going forward in 2024, um, we are likely to see a gradual increase. Um, and then, you know, as you mentioned, the stocks are trading quite high, so if there are some um, disappointments, then that might indicate a reset and some downgrades. Chloe, thanks so much. It's going to be a very interesting Thank week, you. especially on the trading front. We'll see yeah. who gets it right and who doesn't. Bloomberg's Chloe Mealy there with the very latest on banks. Now, for some of the other stories making news, and Bloomberg has also learned that BNP Paribas has hired close to 30 people to launch a new securities operation in China. Now, after receiving regulatory approval, the French bank will build out its brokerage, research, and asset management units. Now, this comes as the lender opts out of investment banking amid a deal slump. The UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is pushing to pass a law declaring Rwanda a safe country for the deportation of asylum seekers. Now, the bill in the House of Commons today seeks to circumvent a Supreme Court ruling from last year. This comes as Sunak makes a 48-hour Europe trip to defend his record on defence and regain momentum 10 days ahead of key set for uh, local elections. Now, Olaf Scholz says he's optimistic on his country's economic prospects. Speaking at a major trade fair in Hanover, the German chancellor highlighted record employment and slowing inflation thanks to falling energy costs. Now, the potential economic turnaround so far has not helped the electoral prospects of his social Democrat Party. So we'll have plenty more, of course, on some of these stories. We'll look for earnings. We're also looking for what market traders are preparing for. So not only earnings, but a lot of the futures, of course, uh, focused on big tech. The other thing we're watching out for is further Treasury auctions. Bloomberg Brief is ahead, and this is Bloomberg.